Hello, hello. Welcome back to a very special and very personal episode of Leading Women in Tech. If you've seen the title for this episode, you may be a little bit surprised that I'm talking about leadership lessons from my dad, who by sort of definition as a father is my is a man. And I don't get men on this show. Not completely against it. But it's not something I prioritize because I think there are so many great women out there that need a voice. I'm like, let's prioritize the women. But you may know if you've been around here for a while, I lost my dad at the end of 2023. And he has been so foundational to the work that I do. And he would have been very surprised to hear that. Uh, Sadly, he was already sick with Alzheimer's by the time I started my business And so although at that point we could have conversations, I'm not entirely sure he ever really fully understood what I did. He loved my tech career. He loved talking about supercomputing with me. He thought that was the most extraordinary thing that he had a daughter working in supercomputing. But I know that the work I now do is partly based on my experience growing up with that dad and the conversations I had as an adult. And what I want to share with you today are some of the key traits that I now teach, that I live by, that I breathe by, that I, as a CEO, do every day that came from him. And some he was probably aware of and some not so much. So please humor me as I honor my dad and tell you about how he helped make me a better leader. Here we go. The first and potentially most characteristic quality of my dad is something my entire family have. (laughs) We're stubborn. We talk about stubbornness all the time in my family. My parents have told you that they caught it from their daughters. I'm not quite sure it works that way, mum. But for my entire life, I have had my parents tell me about the stubbornness in our family. I'm going to reframe this as persistence and perseverance. Because one of the traits I know has served me well up to a point, and there's always a point here on everything we ever talk about, is my ability to persist and persevere. I am not afraid to keep going. I am not afraid to do hard things once I decide that they're worth doing. And I will stick at things for a good long while. I don't give up. And I think that is a quality that I had not appreciated is actually relatively rare. People are stubborn. And we talk about stubbornness and they they won't change their minds and do these things. But there's another level to stubbornness, which is persistence. And I certainly would say, I don't think I'd have finished my PhD if I wasn't stubborn, if I wasn't persistent, if I didn't persevere. It was tough. I tell you, doing a PhD in computational physics and supercomputing, I'm sure all PhDs are tough, but like it was tough. Like it really tested my mental resilience my grit, my ability to complete something that was really hard and lonely, actually. Um, Whereas in my first degree, I was saying that you have peaks and troughs of stress, you know, exam time, dissertation time, all that kind of massive peak of stress. A PhD, I used to talk to this when I was advising students, your PhD, the stress just ramps up over the years. It just (laughs) never comes back down. You don't get a big peak, you just get a whole load of up, 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 up. And there's no surprise that the day I handed in uh, my thesis, what in some countries would call a dissertation, I then just cried for a couple of days. Like the re- emotional relief of like, oh my God, like that's that step down. I still had to defend my my thesis, but the, the big step of like having completed the work and written it up, oh my goodness me. And I would say a lot of the work I've done is about persistence. It's about being able to pursue something and knowing it's worth doing the hard bit that's uncomfortable and quite often requires you to step into your growth zone. And I would definitely say my dad emulated that. He wasn't afraid of sticking at something. My entire family do this, sometimes to our detriment. Sometimes we're stubborn for the sake of being stubborn. But I think when it's a great leadership trait is when we see something through, even though it's uncomfortable. And I think my dad on a daily basis that I am persistent, I have grit, I have determination. And he modeled that for me from my earliest memories. 
But the other thing that he has shown me in spades is patience for others. He was such a patient human being, such an empathetic and patient human being, actually. I think his patience came from his compassion and empathy. And I always think it started off in animals. My dad was a psychologist. He was a professor in in the US since he was professor in, in UK language. He was a senior lecturer, but he he was in the psychology world. He worked as an animal psychologist. He worked as a child psychologist. Yes, as a young child, I was brought into the lab <laughs> and used as an experiment when he didn't have enough people to study. He would put me in front of his students. I'd get to play with toys. I thought it was the world's best thing, but they'd be observing me and seeing how children respond to different things. Um, there's a there's a good reason why I'm a bit cuckoo. <laughs> I had two psychologists as parents, and I I think that patience that he had stems from his desire to work with other species. Actually, he always had a passion for animals. He moved from a zoology degree to a psychology department because they had more live animals than dead animals. <laughs> And this was so paramount growing up. I remember he was the one who could just be so patient with our pets. Uh, You know, a cat could be having a terrible time of it and he would just hold patience. And actually it was something that my mum and I both were devastated by was as his disease progressed, that patience was one of the things that went. Patience for other humans, but also patience for our pets. It was really striking to me. He went from the most patient and kind and empathetic human I knew around our cats to someone who just couldn't tolerate them being a little bit out of whack because they were having a bad time or they were old. And it was a real sign of what he lost. But that just highlighted to me how beautiful a gift it was. His level of patience was unlike so many other people I know. I'm not actually sure I know anybody who was as patient as he is, particularly with animals. And I took that and I said, I want to emulate that in the work I do. And I now see patience as foundational to my success. And I teach it as a leadership trait. Because as a leader, you are unusual. We are in a minority. We're we're a big minority. There are plenty of us. But there are more people who aren't leaders than are leaders. And a lot of the time as a leader, you're dealing with people who are not operating at your level, who aren't as ambitious as you are, who aren't as driven as you are, who don't have the same vision. But irrespective, your job is to bring these people together and and corral them around something. And that requires patience. And I thank my dad to this day that he showed the power of patience and what it can achieve, even when it's uncomfortable and hard. And it is such a beautiful gift. It really is. Which brings me to the third point here. My dad, I don't know if he ever said this to me, but I truly believe my dad thought, Anyone can do anything. (laughs) Anyone can do anything. Now, I've come to the realization that's not entirely true or that simple. I actually remember coming home from school one day and having a conversation with my mum sat in the kitchen and said, this girl at school, she can't can't do everything, mum. And I was just in tears, realizing there was this girl who couldn't do, she just could not do some of the things that me and my other pupils could do. And that broke my heart because up until that point, I genuinely believed anyone can do anything if you give them the right opportunity. Opportunity is key and patience is key, but anyone could do anything. So yes, my reality was breaking. I was actually quite young when that happened. I was still at primary school, so I don't know how old, but I must have been under the age of 10. But that still stuck with me. Because if you put together patience with a belief that anyone can do a lot of things, you allow yourself to believe that person can step into the growth mindset. And so much more is available to them if they're just supported in the right way. If we go through life thinking everybody is fixed and their traits are just where they're at, then you cannot support them in the way you want to. And I think such a huge gift is to believe that everybody has so much more potential than you see when you just scratch the surface. Maybe anyone can do anything. Maybe we just need to give them the right place to leave with the right thing. 
Which brings me to determination and grit. And I mentioned these earlier in terms of perseverance, stubbornness, persistence. Determination is a different level. Persistence is like, keep going, keep going, keep going. Determination is a belief. Grit is a belief that if you keep going, something's going to happen. I truly believe that the business I'm building is going to change the world. I say it every day. When I first started saying it, I used to laugh at myself. I don't laugh anymore. I truly believe I have this determination that what I'm doing can change the world. And once again, I thank my father for that. That belief that if you keep going, something awesome is going to happen. Something extraordinary is possible. Keeps you going through the tough times. There will be tough times. Life is 50-50. You only get to do the awesome things because you also did the hard things. You only get to experience joy because you also know what not joy is feels like. If we only experience joy, we wouldn't have anything to realize there's another alternative. And I think determination allows you to have all those ambitions, all that joy, and not be intimidated by it. Determination gets you through and says, I'm going to get there and I'm going to enjoy the journey. Another maybe surprising thing from a dad who was born in the 40s, grew up in the 60s, had kids in the 80s, is feminism. My dad was, till the day he died, I would say, a feminist. Not in, you know, a traditional sense or anything, but in the sense that I think feminism is about inclusion. Feminism is a leadership trait of inclusion, of not being exclusionary, of saying everybody at this table is capable and welcome and everybody has a place. My dad was never intimidated by having three daughters. My mum has told me many stories about how people asked them when they had me, I was the third youngest daughter, if they'd tried for a third because they wanted a boy. And my parents were like, hell no. (laughs) My dad never thought it was wrong that he had three daughters. He just embraced it. He would (laughs) have us doing all kinds of weird things. I have very strong memories of lying under a van in a car park in the pouring rain, lying in a puddle trying to fix fix the engine of this van that had broken down. We did DIY, we did gardening, we did all the things. There was nothing wrong with us because of our gender. And equally, my dad was very happy to take me clothes shopping. I have vivid memories of buying a tartan miniskirt with my dad, and he was just not intimidated by that at all. Something that was not that common in the 1980s. But having a dad who was very much happy to be different back then... I was like, it's okay to be different and it's okay to do things because it's who you are. It's not about fitting in, which brings me to my next point, doing stuff because it is right and not about fitting in. My father would tell you that he could have gone further in his career if he was just prepared to do the politics. Politics was not his strong suit. (laughs) Just say that out loud. Um, And he was very open about that. He had no interest in playing office politics at all. He was there because he loved his research and he loved his students That was why he worked in a university. He detested the politics. But what he did teach me with that is he did stuff because it was right. He didn't do stuff to fit in. Now, I'm a recovering people pleaser. You think I would have got this sooner. It took me until the last decade to realize my people pleasing, which is very much a societal infliction, I would say, on me, because I didn't think either my mom or my dad are people pleasers. Um, Mom, if you listen to this, you have to tell me whether or not you think you're a people pleaser. I don't personally have that as a, as a vision from my childhood of my parents being people pleasers. And so I think my people pleasing came with my cultural expectations. And it took until my 30s to really look at my mom and my dad and say, I don't have to do things just to fit in. Why am I doing that? I should be doing things because it's right. And that was my journey towards letting go of my people pleasing, which if you've been around here for a while, you know it's such an important leadership trait. It is paramount to our success as leaders. We have to do things because it is the right thing to do, even if it makes people uncomfortable or unhappy. We can do that in eloquent ways. We can do this in really healthy ways. But sometimes you're going to upset people. Sometimes you have to do something which is going to hurt someone, not because it's malicious, but because they don't like it. But it's still right. Which brings me to another thing, ethics. My dad had incredibly strong ethics. It was never really talked about at home. 
I wouldn't say ethics as a word came up except in the context of psychology. We had a lot of conversations about psychology around the dinner table. It's why I went off and did physics. I was like, I want nothing to do psychology. Oops, Daisy, here we are talking leadership. That's kind of psychology. <laughs> but there we are. Um, but oh, the conversations we had around ethics were very much focused on the ethics of doing experiments, psychology, how people interact with each other. But I, my parents would do things because they were ethically, fundamentally right. And again, this was role model to me from a very early age. I can't imagine either of my parents doing something that wasn't ethical. Like their ethics and mine, I would say, are different today. And like I'm my own human. We have a very similar ethics. And I'm just trying to think if I can think of an example off the top of my head where our ethics are not fully aligned, but I'm sure they aren't because I think everybody's ethics are slightly different. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it challenges us to like, why are my ethics where they're at? But acting with your ethics, and again, it's like not doing stuff, not because you want to fit in, but doing it because it's right. That again is such an important leadership trait. Balancing ethics and the business requirements, balancing ethics and getting things done, doing things because they're right in the broader scheme of things. Another key trait about my dad that I actually mentioned at his funeral was my dad's passion for what other people do. You could meet my dad and five minutes later, he was your biggest advocate. He'd be like, oh my God, did you know that this person wants to do this, 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 and this, and this? How awesome is that? They could be doing all these things. He was so excited and inspired by everybody around him. It almost didn't matter what you were doing. He didn't fully understand my business. As I said, I came into my business when he was already sadly quite sick and he he was excited by what I did, but I, he wasn't as excited as he was about my career in super competing. And I think purely because of how sick he was with Alzheimer's. I think that was our early wake up call really to the, the journey he was on towards the end. And I think it's such a gift to the human race to be able to be inspired and excited by other people. I don't hear many of us doing that. And I would say I'm definitely emotionally multi-passionate. I remember one of my bosses earlier in my career saying to me, did you like that talk, Tony? I was like, oh my God, yes, I could totally go into this. And she was like, that's your problem, Tony. <laughs> you want to do all the things. You get excited about anything you hear about. I definitely call that from my father. The trick is to pick one thing at a time. But it is such a beautiful gift when you can be passionate about everything. And I'd say as a coach, being passionate about what my clients do, even if it's not what something I would do, serves me so well in my ability to hold space. So as a leader, if you can get excited about what your team is excited about, even if it's not the same angle that you are, you are going to be a better coach for them, which makes you a better leader. Another thing I think my dad had, and again, I'm not sure he would even have said this. I, I wish I could have recorded this a decade ago and asked him about all of this, and he would have just been very embarrassed by him, is his situational awareness. Now, I wouldn't say his self-awareness was that good, but no, sorry, dad, <laughs> but I, know, I, I didn't think it was, but his situational awareness was sky high. He could read a room. He could understand the nuances of the people in front of him. He could be like, this is what they need to hear. I talk a lot in my coaching of, you've got somebody at point A, you need them at point B. There's a blocker in the middle. What is that? How to figure it out, how to get them through that. I got that from my father. I've never known anybody as good at understanding somebody else's blockers than my dad. I don't think he would ever have told you that because he hated fitting in. He hated the politics. And sometimes this is about the politics. And so he kind of resisted that side of himself at times. But his ability to identify the blockers was unlike any other human I know. And I certainly think that is where I got that piece from. And it served me so well in my career and continues to serve me so well today as a coach and as a CEO. Another thing my dad would never have said was his major skill, and I came very late to appreciating, was his ability to do public speaking, sharing a vision and being excited. Now, with his passion for what other people do, I should probably have not been surprised by this. But you know, I was like an awkward teenager. My dad's embarrassing, parents are embarrassing. And I remember it was like just, I was still at university. So I must be like 20, 21. 
and he was doing a talk and I was turning up late to like meet my mum and dad for dinner afterwards or something like that. And so I walked in and I caught the last 15 minutes. And I was like, oh, it's going to be excruciating. Watch my dad speak. And I walked into the room and I was like, this is, this is, the, this is a man I've not met before. He was on stage. He was speaking about a topic that was a hobby of his. It wasn't his main thing. But his ability to hold that room was profound. I was like, wow, I want to be able to speak like that. I never knew my dad could do that. Of course he could. He was a university lecturer. I, I later learned this because you, if you talk to a room full of students every day for 30 weeks of the year, you get pretty good at public speaking or you get a reputation for being a terrible lecturer, at which point they don't invite you back. So I got pretty good at public speaking. And then I've also had a public speaking coach, which has taken me to a whole other level. But it was watching my father hold that room, hold that room with his excited vision, being able to transmit his vision. I was like, that's what I want to be able to do. When you can make people that excited, you can change the world because you can change the direction of those people in that room. You could say the same kind of content and leave everybody just like, eh, yeah, we're not going to do anything different. If you've got something important to say, you need the eloquence to get people on board, get them behind you, get them following you. A leader needs that tool in her toolkit. And I only realized that in my 20s, watching my dad. The final thing I really learned from my dad, and this is not one he will, <laughs> he would have recognized at all, but I learned this through watching my dad being uncomfortable. Don't do things that aren't in your zone of genius. Growing up, my dad would take on DIY, he would take on fixing cars, he would do all sorts of things to save us money, essentially. You know, like we, we grew up in an era where there wasn't as much money to go around, so he would do things to save money. And a lot of those things where something he detested, were not in his own genius, would take him a whole day to do something. It would take a professional in that area of half an hour, but he persisted. So he did teach me persistence and stubbornness, but the cost to that, to him of doing that was profound. It was the first time in my life I ever heard him angry and he was angry at himself. In fact, I would say most of the time my dad ever demonstrated anger, ever, it was always internal focused. I don't think until quite late on, actually, in his Alzheimer's, I ever saw him being angry externally. I know from my mom, he has been angry about things, but he kept it personal, he kept it quiet. Probably my mom and him, like, kept it between them. I certainly do. My husband, if I'm angry about something, it tends to be very private between me and my husband. I don't think it's useful to the rest of society for me to share my anger. I think anger is a very unhelpful emotion. Maybe I got that from my dad too. I don't know. <laughs> but he would turn his anger on himself more often than not. When he was doing something that he did not like, that he didn't feel he was a good at, he wasn't confident at, he would procrastinate. And then when he did do it, he'd get angry with himself. And I just realized so early on, don't do things that are not in your zone of genius. And I talk about your four zones, your zone of drudgery, distraction, disinterest, and genius. You should be aiming to get rid of everything in drudgery and distraction. Well, drudgery and, and disinterest. Distraction you need to get rid of or move into your genius. Like that's a whole other episode for another day. But I really got that from my dad. There is no point in fighting something if it's not your own genius. Yes, it might cost you money, but you're going to have that 10 times over to make more money because you're going to have more energy, have more stamina, more creativity, more ideas because you're not burning yourself out on things that are just not your zone of genius and you don't want them to be your zone of genius either. That was a very important lesson I learned very early on from my dad. One he probably never intended, but I'm so grateful that he did because now I hire based on what do I need to get off my plate. I don't base on hiring, which it's very easy to do, hiring people who are like me um, you want to hire people like you. That's part of where our unconscious bias problems kick in. No, I hire because I need this thing off my plate. It's their zone of genius. It's my zone of drudgery. I do that because of my dad. When my husband first suggested to me a very long time ago now that we get a cleaner, I was like, oh my God, we're going to spend money on a cleaner. I am now the biggest advocate for us spending money on things that are not in my zone of genius and not my husband's zone of genius. Gardening. I love gardening, but I just don't have time for it. And when I've had a really long day, I just want to potter and do the fun things. 
I don't want to do the hard graft in the garden. So we outsource that. I get the car cleaned. Someone to come to my house. I don't even have to drive my car somewhere. And gradually, as I'm improving my life, I'm gradually outsourcing more and more. So I can spend more time doing my zone of genius. And when I'm not doing my zone of genius, recharging, right? The things that are in my zone of drudgery don't recharge me. And as a leader, I have to be 100% charged as much of the time as possible because that's how I'm changing the world. I hope these leadership lessons from my dad have given you some ideas of where you might want to be looking at your leadership. And I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about my dad. There's ups and downs in there. You know, I'm completely open and honest. And my dad was amazing, but he was far from perfect. He would say there's no such thing as perfect. And I would kind of agree with him other than I think perfectionism is all about how we decide to view the world. So thank you, dad. I miss you so much. But thank you for sharing with me all of this and helping put me here today. Thank you so much. Leaders, until next time, as always, stay on your tech leadership game, follow your dreams because the world really does need that uniqueness that you bring as a leading woman in tech.